All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, it is 10.01 and we have a lot of content to cover today. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, welcome to the FY26 How to Apply webinar about the GFO on your application. Um, I'm Laura Weiss. I am a program director here with the Maryland State Arts Council, and I am joined by my colleague and co-program director, Emily Sollenberger. You've probably heard from one or both of us in some capacity over the past couple of weeks, just reminding you about uh, the GFO on year application. Um, so we're here today just to talk about uh, the full application for those who are in an on year cycle or if you are new to the GFO program. So we're going to be concentrating just on that particular application for today. Um, just a reminder before we get started, the session is being recorded. So it's uh, it, it will be recorded and then shared out on our website. So it will be available to you or to your colleagues uh, to be able to access at any time. Just a few things to get used to if you're not familiar with Google Meet, um, just so you know where the controls are. There's the little microphone icon towards the bottom of the screen. We do ask that you remain on mute during today's session, just so we can avoid any kind of background noise. Um, we're also going to ask you to hold on any questions until the very end. We'll hold some space at the end for questions and answers. Hopefully we'll have addressed your question throughout the presentation, but we will do our best to, uh, to take any questions at the end. Um, you're, you're welcome to be on or off screen. However you are comfortable is fine by us. You can use the little camera icon to click on or off. There's also the CC uh, little icon that is for closed captioning. You can feel free to turn that on if needed. Those closed captions are computer generated. Um, there's also the little reactions, uh, little smiley face. You can feel free to throw thumbs up and hearts and celebration icons throughout <laughs> if you want to. Um, and there's also the little raise hand function that looks like a hand in a circle. Once we do get to the questions at the end of the presentation, we can use that to raise your hand if you have any questions or comments. Um, additionally, there is also towards the lower right hand corner of your screen, uh, there is the chat box uh, function, looks like a little quotation box uh, kind of thing. Uh, you can, there you go, chat is there, Emily just <laughs> put some, uh, some words in there. You can feel free to utilize that throughout the uh, session. Um, we'll try to monitor that, um, but we will circle back to questions as needed throughout uh, once we get to the end of the presentation. All right, we're going to start with our uh, grounding documents. I'm going to read the next couple of slides out loud for accessibility purposes. The first is our land acknowledgement statement, and that is that we acknowledge the lands and waters now known as Maryland are the home of its first peoples, the Akahanic Indian tribe, Assateague People's Tribe, Cedarville Band of Piscataway Indians, Choptico Band of Indians, Lenape Tribe, Nanticoke Tribe, Nasuwewash Band of Indians, Piscataway Conoy Tribe, Piscataway Indian Nation, Pocomoke Indian Nation, Susquehannock Indians, Yakagani River Band of Shawnee, and tribes in the Chesapeake watershed who have seemingly vanished since the coming of colonial. We acknowledge that this land is now home to other tribal peoples living here in diaspora. We acknowledge the forced removal of many from the lands and waterways that nurtured them as kin. We acknowledge the degradation that continues to be wrought on the land and waters in pursuit of resources. We acknowledge the right of the land and waterways to heal so that they can continue to provide food and medicine for all. We acknowledge that it is our collective obligation to pursue policies and practices that respect the land and waters so that our reciprocal relationship with them can be fully restored. And I do just want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge that our land acknowledgement statement is actually receiving uh, an award at the NASA, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies uh, conference next week. So the, the work that was done on this statement is being uh, recognized nationwide, which we are really, really excited about. Next is our equity and justice statement. And that is that the arts celebrate our state's diversity, connect our shared humanity, and transform individuals and communities. 
The Maryland State Arts Council and its supporting collaborators are committed to advancing and modeling equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion in all aspects of our organizations and across communities of our state. MSAC and its grantees are committed to embracing equity and non-discrimination regardless of race, religious creed, color, age, gender expression, sexual orientation, class, language, and or ability. Next is our vision statement, and that is that the Maryland State Arts Council plays an essential role ensuring every person has access to the transformative power of the arts. And we do that through our mission, which is to advance the arts in our state by providing leadership that champions creative expression, diverse programming, equitable access, lifelong learning, and the arts as a celebrated contributor to the quality of life for all of the people of Maryland. Next up, you will see uh, five goals that are associated with our 2019 strategic plan. We're actually at the, the very, very end of uh, a new strategic planning process. So we're about to roll out some new goals, but uh, these goals are still absolutely relevant. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read those, which is goal one, to increase participation. Goal two, to provide intentional support. Goal three, build capacity. Goal four, leverage connections and goal five, bolster Maryland arts. Next, we have what we call our creative meeting actions. And these are just some ideas to keep in the back of your mind as we go through today's meeting together. And that's to celebrate being in the space with other creative people, engage with everyone's presence as a gift, acknowledge that together we know a lot, enter the conversation with curiosity and inquiry, Share your idea and trust that it will be heard. Use I statements. Focus your language on the task at hand. Hold one another accountable with care. Apply yes and, I hear your idea and I'm going to add to it, and balance speaking and listening. The next slide here is um, a little bit of an advertisement for um, upcoming professional development opportunities. Um, we have lots going on at the Maryland State Arts Council. So um, we encourage you to uh, visit our Eventbrite page, which is where you signed up for this session. And Emily just put the link into the chat for you there. We have all kinds of different topic specific sessions that happen. Uh, we partner with Maryland Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts and other organizations to present on specific uh, uh, topics. Uh, we also are bringing back our Coffee with the Council series, which is uh, an opportunity to come together on uh, select Tuesday mornings virtually to just talk about uh, things that are on your mind as artists and organizations. Um, we're also holding uh, different regional uh, office hours throughout the state. We have one coming up uh, tomorrow, actually, in Caroline County that Emily will be at. Um, and then we also partner uh, uh, with our uh, fellow organizations for the Maryland Arts Summit, which happens uh, in June of every year. So there'll be more details on that as we move into the new year. And lastly here, we have uh, just some information about ways to get involved with the Maryland State Arts Council. Um, you can go to our website, uh, the ways to get involved, um, this is where we have our different public calls uh, that are that are currently out there. We're always looking to work with uh, different individuals to serve on our panels um, and other programs to evaluate applications uh, and work with us on different programs. Right now, we actually have our call for panelists for the GFO program. Um, so if you are interested in, uh, in evaluating uh, applications in working in that capacity as a panelist, um, we absolutely encourage you to do so. And yes, you can be a panelist and also have uh, your organization go through an on-year review. It would just be a conflict of interest. You obviously would not review that application, um, but it's a really, really great way to uh, to learn about the program, to kind of see it from another perspective. Um, we've heard that time and time again from panelists that it's one of the best ways that they've learned how to improve their grant writing and other skills associated with uh, applying for funding. So 
if that's of interest to you, please consider uh, applying. The application is due on October 30th, um, and it is a paid opportunity. So that's something really important to point out. All right, I think that those are all of the, the grounding beginning slides there. So we're going to get into today's agenda. Um, really, uh, what we're focused on here is the GFO program. So we're going to start with just a little review of what the GFO program is and also walk through what the GFO timeline is and the next steps that you can expect over the coming months. Um, we're also going to do a quick review of the application and the scoring rubric and also talk about the funding formula that is utilized uh, in the GFO program. And then we'll just have a quick uh, little review of Smart Simple in case that is new to you. And hopefully we will have some time for some questions and answers at the end. Um, but just one more reminder before we jump into it. Today we are focused on the on-year application only. So if you are here uh, and you're not a part of that process, if you're in an off year or something like that, we're not going to be talking about that today. We will have an off-year session uh, similar to this, but focused on the off-year application that will be held on Friday, November the 1st. All right, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Emily. Great, thanks, Laura, and good morning, everybody. So great to see familiar names and faces um, this morning. Uh, so like Laura said, we're going to go through um, a quick overview of the GFO program. Um, as a reminder, this is a program that provides operating support to strengthen and sustain our Maryland arts infrastructure. So in the current FY25 fiscal year, uh, we've awarded approximately $18.1 million in the Grants for Organization funding to 309 organizations across the state, which is really exciting. Um, and you'll hear this over some repetitive information over and over uh, in this session. But as a reminder, uh, moving forward, the application deadline for the uh, on-year application is going to be Friday, November 15th. And that should say 2024, not 25, um, by 11.59 uh, p.m. And just to note that um, technical assistance will not be available after normal business hours. So if you need some support, we highly recommend uh, that you get in touch with us early. Uh, Laura and I usually work Monday through Friday, eight to four-ish. Uh, so just be in touch with us um, before that last minute deadline. Okay, so who can apply? Um, if you're a returning applicant and you've already been accepted to the GFO program, um, you are eligible to apply for the on-year application. Um, you've probably been notified already, maybe multiple times by myself or Laura, um, if you are in an on-year uh, cycle by discipline or other circumstances, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit. Um, so you should already know if you're in an on-year for this upcoming FY26 cycle or not. If you're new to the program, meaning you have not received funding in the past or perhaps you um, lapsed in funding um, in FY25, you would have needed to submit an intent to apply application that was due on September 15th and then accepted into the program. So if you're a new organization that did not submit an intent to apply or not approved, you will not be able to submit that full application for FY26 funding. Um, if there's any confusion around that uh, new organization, if you're a new applicant, please again, be in touch with us so we can work through any questions or challenges that might come up in that area. All right, so um, the we we use the terms on and off year when it comes to the different types of applications, and that falls within um, a, a three-year cycle for the GFO program. And the three-year cycle is really just based around your artistic discipline, um, which is just for our purposes to kind of categorize our organizations throughout the year. So um, this is not a cycle where you apply every three years, you're applying every year for annual um, support. It's just the type of application um, that changes. So the three-year cycle refers to going into an on-year, which means your organization completes a, a full application and goes through a panel process 
which then determines your panel score. And that is used to determine your funding. And we'll go through that what that variable means a little bit later in the presentation. So that three-year cycle means you're going into an on-year um, every three years. And the two years in between, you'll be completing a shorter application that does not involve a panel review. Um, and that is called the off-year application. Uh, so moving into FY26, so this upcoming fall for the November 15th deadline, our organizations that are going into an on-year are those that fall into the Music C category, Dance, or Multidiscipline A category, and then any new organizations will be in a, in a separate kind of multidiscipline panel as well. Um, so then you'll see, you know, those those folks are bolded. The other folks that are not bolded here, you can kind of see the the schedule. So next year for FY27, it's our theater, service, folk and traditions, and multidiscipline B that will be going into an on year. And then the following year for going into the FY28 cycle, our music, literary, and visual and media arts organizations. And then you can kind of see for the FY29 that cycle then um, continues uh, uh, loops back around for that three year. So for example, if a new organization comes in and they're perhaps a theater organization, they'll be completing that, that full application, that on-year as a new organization, and then fall into the theater discipline. So then they'd be going into another on-year for FY27. Uh, so moving into just the kind of um, highlighting the new organizations that are coming into the program, perhaps for the first time or, or lapsed funding, um, you will complete a full application in the first year and then submit, um, then fall into that discipline that I mentioned. Um, so again, you'd be uh, falling into a multidiscipline panel, panel unless your discipline is already in an on year, and then you'd be in, included in that appropriate discipline specific panel. Um, if you're approved for FY26 funding, you would then fall into that discipline cycle for future years. All right. Um, so moving into kind of what the on-year application process looks like. Um, this is not just about the written application, and we like to really uplift that part because there are multiple steps and multiple pieces involved in the on-year application review. So you will be submitting that um, written application uh, by November 15th, and that initial review and scoring is done by the panel um, on their own time. Um, after that part is completed, uh, the panelists will then complete two extension assignments for your organization. Um, and we'll go into this a little bit more detail, but there's um, two separate types of assignments, the artistic activity visit and an in-depth conversation. So that is a requirement of the on-year review process that you get a visit uh, by two separate panelists to complete those two, two pieces. Um, the application um, is also re reviewed by the State Arts Council staff, so that's Laura and myself, um, and we also um, score the financials um, as well. So the panelists are not involved with scoring financials, that really falls on the State Arts Council staff. And then all of that work culminates in a panel meeting um, later in the spring where the panel takes all of the information provided in the discussion, um, including what they've learned in extension assignments, what the staff um, contributes, and then they can resubmit final scores. So uh, part of the process is having an initial score and then a final score um, at the panel meeting. So again, like I mentioned, the panelists will be assigned to complete those two extension assignments for each organization going in an on year. So you'll have, um, again, two separate activities, one active artistic activity visit and one panelist will conduct an in-depth conversation. So it's two different panelists with two different goals. And it's really up to the panelist who's assigned to your organization and your organization staff to schedule these events and conversations to make sure those extension assignments are complete. Um, so you can expect a panelist will reach out to you probably in early February to schedule. Um, Laura and I usually send um, some emails out. So, so just to know that what to expect and our panelists are also prepared um, with a list of emails so they know that they can contact you all um, directly. So a little bit more detail about what these um, extension assignments um, look like and, and kind of the goals here. So 
the role of the artistic activity visit and that panelist is really for them to, um, to get evidence of the written application through an interaction guided by the representatives of an organization. So it, it's important to note that we're, they're really looking to experience programs and opportunities as if they were a member of the public. Um, and it's, it's really an opportunity for the panelists to advocate for the great work that you all are doing um, and to connect that work to your mission and to the written application. An important piece to note that's here in italics is that um, artistic merit and excellence are not a part of this evaluation criteria for this experience. It's really just for them to, to experience your programming um, and make that direct connection to, to the written application. So um, an artistic act activity visit might include something like an attendance at a performance, an exhibition, an event. Um, if those types of public activities are not happening for your organization, that's okay. There are some other alternatives that, that can come into play here too. So um, if you don't have something that um, a panelist can attend in public, um, you might um, consider a meeting, which would involve looking at photos, videos, data, um, any, any type of um, kind of past artistic experience or activities that could be shared um, between the panelists and the staff. Um, you could also have a meeting that involves looking at the website or your social media to kind of explore those kind of programmatic highlights and artistic um, activities that you're doing throughout the year. Um, and it also could include um, artists or members of the organization to really talk through the goals and activities um, throughout the year. The second extension assignment is the in-depth conversation. So this is a little bit different. This, this person, the panelist that um, is connected to the in-depth conversation is really looking to help clarify any questions um, through that, uh, that might come up with the written application. So the, the conversation would be centered around um, any kind of, uh, of, of the written application questions or things that panelists just might want a little bit more information and clarity around. Um, so again, uh, it, this meeting actually does not have to take place in person. If it doesn't work out, it can take place um, virtually. So Zoom, Google Meet, Teams, whatever um, everybody agrees upon or, or by phone. Um, again, it's up to the organization to determine who uh, takes part in these types of conversations. We recommend, you know, um, you know, perhaps the executive or managing director, um, artistic director, perhaps a board president or other board representatives, um, folks from your artistic team. Um, you know, it, it just has to be a handful of, of people. It doesn't need to be, um, you know, 10 to 12 people that involved in the call. You might consider um, maybe two or three people from the organization to have that conversation with the panelist. All right, so what does this look like in terms of a timeline here? So we had a lot of pieces we just discussed, um, but here's what it looks like kind of if, if you're you're planning your calendar out. So uh, right now uh, we're um, October 17th. So the application is currently open in Smart Simple. So you have access to that now. You can start your draft at any time. Again, the application for the on-year um, is due November 15th by 1159. Uh, once the applications are submitted, uh, the panelists will then be assigned to your application so they can review and score independently online. Um, so that will happen from basically December through January. Um, and then Laura and I will also be reviewing your applications and scoring your financials at around the same time. So once uh, that part is complete, the panelists will then have um, another training and they will move into those extension assignments that we just discussed. So you can expect um, an email from somebody from your panelists probably in early February um, and they are tasked with getting that completed by around mid-March. So we'll send out some more particular dates um, and all of this information in email as well. So your team has it, all of our panelists have the same information. Once those uh, those extension assignments are complete, um, in late March, early April, April is when we will have our panel meetings by discipline. Um, you will also be notified when your organization will be reviewed. So uh, each organization will have a day that they will be a part of, of a schedule of reviews. I think we're looking at what, eight or nine separate 
panel meetings this year. Um, so we'll send out that schedule so you're aware before that meeting, um, it's open to the public for anybody to observe. Once that's complete, uh, Laura and I uh, take all of our information, um, funding formulas, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later, and make recommendations uh, to the council um, about the grant amounts um, and what and how that is determined based on our budget, which we get a little bit later in the year. Then you can expect your notification of the FY26 grants um, after the first of the year. So we do have to wait until the fiscal year starts before we send out that notification. So it's usually around mid to late July. We try to get out as soon as we can. Um, and those notifications are sent via Smart Simple to the email um, connected to your account. Um, throughout July and August, uh, we're happy to pull feedback for our organizations and have any discussions um, around any recommendations that came from the panel. And of course, throughout the year, uh, Lauren, myself, and other staff members are available to help answer questions, provide support, meet with your staff and board, attend programs and events, um, and just uh, experience your programming as well. Finally, uh, there are final reports due at the end of each fiscal year on August 15th. So if you received FY25 funding, so the current fiscal year, you will have a report due on August 15th. Um, if you did not receive GFO funding in FY25 and you're a new organization, you don't have to worry about that until the end of FY26 if you're recommended for funding. Also a note here for our folks that have been in the program for a while, uh, we no longer have interim reports, so that's been eliminated um, as of this year. So we only have the one report um, due August 15th every year. Um, as we move uh, closer to the, the deadline here in the next couple of weeks, Laura and I also wanted to make sure that um, as you're kind of planning ahead, if you need any support from us, um, we will be attending our National Assembly State Arts Agencies uh, the, uh, conference next week. So we will be out of the office um, from the 22nd through the 27th. So just keep that in mind while you're preparing. There's also a couple of state holidays um, prior to the, the deadline. So Election Day on the 5th and Veterans Day on the 11th are state holidays. So we will be closed um, and not available for any support during that time. So um, again, just ask us questions early um, and get started early as you can. All right, so I'm gonna pass it back over to Laura to go into the application and scoring rubric. All right, thanks so much, Emily. Um, so we're going to, uh, I'm going to move pretty quickly through the application here. It's a lot of information to take in. Um, like Emily said, it is available now in Smart Simple. There's also a Word document version of it on our website. So, you know, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to move quickly, but you'll have plenty of resources and plenty of time to be able to take this in, in, uh, in more detail as you need to do so. So, um, the first part of the application is just some basic information, your contact information uh, for your organization. Um, we do need the, the UEI, which is the Unique Entity Identifier. Most organizations at this point have this. If you have not gotten that information from SAM.gov, this is a federal uh, thing, a federal requirement. Uh, you do need to get that information. So um, do be, you know, you log on to SAM.gov if you have not secured that information. If you have questions or concerns about the UEI, be in touch with myself or Emily and uh, we can help you through that from our standpoint. Um, there are four narrative sections uh, to the application and we're going to break down those questions here. Um, and then there are financials, additional attachments, and finally, just an authorization signature at the end of the application. Um, that authorization signature is just typing in that person's name. It's not, sometimes people think it's some kind of like, uh, you need a software or something like that to sign it. It is just typing in the name at the end. Um, and like I said, there are plenty of resources that are available on the website, msac.org, including the guidelines, um, the application as a Word document. There's also a financial uh, template that is formatted as an Excel spreadsheet. So that is often helpful if you're trying to work through your, your financials, that's available there. 
Um, this session, uh, along with the slide deck, will also be posted. And we also have some other just helpful kind of how-to videos that will be on the website as well. All right, so breaking it down here into the, the application, the first section, narrative section A, is really um, focused on addressing why the work of your organization is important. Um, the first question uh, is just looking at what are the vision, mission, goals, and or values of the organization. And you'll see here after the question in italics, we've put uh, what we call the excellent to outstanding response score. So if you go onto our website, uh, you'll see the full rubric, which breaks down all of the point values uh, and then the different kind of categories of those points for each of these questions. But I'm going to refer to the excellent to outstanding response, which is the highest score. Um, so for this particular question, what we're looking for is a clear, specific, and thorough evidence of your vision, mission, goals, and or values. Question two, very much related to question number one, is how have the vision, or excuse me, how have the mission, vision, goals, and or values of the organization evolved over the last two years? If there are no changes in this area, consider sharing about any additional significant changes in leadership, staff, program goals, operations that may indicate any growth or evolution for the organization. So really looking at how the organization has changed, evolved, et cetera, over the past two years. And again, that excellent to outstanding response here in italics, we're looking for clear, specific, and thorough explanation of growth or evolution over the past two years. Next up, uh, this is a, a not scored question. This is just an informational piece that kind of helps to give some context for our panelists. Um, and that's looking at what is the geographic area of service for your organization. So that's really looking for what specific communities or counties, cities, are you a statewide organization? It's really just identifying what that area of service is for the organization. So the panelists then can have that as a frame of reference for the reading of the rest of the application. So that's not scored, um, but it's going to be just used throughout. Um, 3B is also not a scored question. This is just another informational piece. And that's really thinking about within that geographic area of service. It's asking you to identify the percentage of programming that is serving the community. So that means other than tuition paying constituents. This would include um, any kind of free activities along with activities that are open to the public to attend that may be free and or could be paid opportunities. So what we mean by tuition paying um, constituents, that's really looking at programming that has a fee for service model. So thinking about any kind of classes, camps, workshops, things like that, that are, uh, you know, a, a specific constituent is paying to participate in that class or that uh, camp or what have you. Um, that's really intended for a specific group, and it's not necessarily open to the public. So that's what we're trying to get at with this question here. Again, it's not scored. It's just an informational piece. The last section uh, of Section A is uh, our activities chart. Um, so this is really going to connect uh, your statements from A1, 2, and 3. Um, and thinking about your day-to-day -day activities. So within this chart, um, you're looking to uh, really show the different programming that you offer um, and how that is uh, aligning with your organization's intentions, processes, and programming overall. So we're looking specifically at a list of events or arts activities that are happening from, um, this is going to be an FY26, so July 1st, 2025 through June 30th, 2026. Um, you're going to list out those different programs and then address each of the columns for your programs. We do like to uh, just kind of offer a piece of advice here. We're, we're looking for kind of the, the larger buckets of the programs. So if you are a theater, for example, 
we're not necessarily looking for you to list six different plays. What we're looking for is maybe the, the overall uh, category of your main stage productions and then addressing the different columns for the main stage productions. And then maybe you have your second stage productions, your uh, you know educational offerings, those kind of things. So it's larger buckets. If you find that you are copying and pasting the same information, think about how you're kind of grouping them together. We're really looking for different responses throughout. Something new here this year is there is a word limit that is uh, in play here on the, the chart. Some of the responses have gotten very, very, very long over the years. So, so they, uh, they do have uh, each section is a 100 word limit. Uh, so just be cognizant of that as you go throughout. All right, moving on here to section B. Uh, this is addressing how your organization designs its programs. Um, first up, we ask you to describe the creative process within your organization's programming. Uh, we ask you to include a description of how artistic decisions are made, who is involved from the organization, and how the constituents and communities, including those that you identified in A3, are also involved in the programmatic development and evaluation of the organization's artistic activities. Um, so really looking at your creative process here. Um, the excellent to outstanding response includes an explanation that clearly illustrates the creative process, which includes creative roles, responsibilities, and authentic constituent collaboration, where constituents are essential in the artistic decision-making process. Question number two here is looking at your long-term or strategic planning. Um, we're, we're asking you to explain that process of long-term or strategic planning. If your organization doesn't have a formalized long-term or strategic plan, then think about how do you design and plan programs and activities for the future and any steps that you're taking towards a more formalized plan. We ask that you explain how the process aligns with your vision, mission, goals, or values, and also to share where you are currently at in that strategic or long-term uh, planning process. Are you actively creating it? Are you implementing it? Is it something that exists and you're evaluating? Um, and then share who is involved in that process. Is it board, staff, volunteers, et cetera? Um, the excellent to outstanding response here is to uh, include a clear and specific explanation of the long-term or strategic planning process that directly connects with your vision, mission, goals, or values. Section C is a long one. There's several questions in Section C, and this is looking at how you address, um, address how your organization operates. So the first is actually an attachment. So we're looking for a graphic or a chart of the organization's staffing or board structure. And that can include, if you are an all volunteer organization, you know that can include your board and your committees. Um, that's what we need by staffing, either paid or volunteer. So that can include board, staff, artists, volunteers, et cetera. We are really looking for a graphic here. I just want to point out that word, graphic or chart. So a list of just names or something like that, that's really not going to illustrate exactly what we're looking for here. So that, that scoring uh, response is really looking for a clear and specific visual explanation of the organization staffing or board structure. The next question is, how is your staffing and board structure? And again, we're looking that that's all encompassing. So board, staff, artists, volunteers, et cetera. How is it currently successful? Um, we ask that you include specific indicators of success in your response. And that excellent to outstanding response includes a clear and specific explanation of indicators of a successful staffing and board structure. Next, we ask what staffing or uh, board and or financial challenges affect the operation of your organization and how are the challenges routinely identified and addressed? And here we, we really um, ask you to consider sharing specific examples or initiatives um, that are impacting the organization. 
So really think about um, that excellent to outstanding response, including a clear and specific commitment to regularly identifying and addressing staffing, board, and or financial challenges. Number four here uh, is asking you to describe your organization's process of financial oversight. Within your response, address the procedures for monitoring and approving the organization's finance and also the process for developing and approving the annual budget. So make sure we're, there's kind of two pieces here. So make sure that we're looking at both the monitoring and uh, approving of the finances and also the development of the annual budget. Sometimes people get one or the other. We're looking for both there. <laughs> so the excellent to outstanding response includes a detailed procedure for developing, monitoring, and approving the finances along with that annual budget piece. Uh, number five here, we're looking, uh, we're looking at some demographics. So based on demographics, and we reference a, a website here that you can use, or you can use other sources that you may find. Um, how does your staffing, and again, that's looking at board, staff, artists, volunteers, et cetera, how does that staffing reflect the population of your geographic area of service? We're asking you to include specific demographic information for your geographic area of service as evidence and include what strategies are in place in, to consider further diversity of your staff in the future. Um, the excellent to outstanding response here is looking for an organization staff and board clearly reflecting the constituency of the geographic area of service or that the organization is aware of how they are not fully reflective of the area and the strategies that they have in place to further uh, to further diversity of their staff and board in the future. That's a long one, so make sure you read that one really carefully. <laughs> All right, moving on to section D here. I know I'm moving quickly. Uh, section D is looking at how your organization evaluates what it does. Um, the first question here is looking at what is the sensory or emotional experience hoped to be achieved through your organization's arts programming. Consider including examples of programs and or intentions related to how you'd want your audiences or community to feel when engaging with your organization. So we're really looking here at uh, how that programming process directly considers the intended sensory or emotional impact. Number two here uh, is how does how do your arts activities consider non-dominant norms, values, narratives, standards, or aesthetics, including non-Eurocentric standards of excellence? The excellent to outstanding response here is that the programming process indicates regular consideration of non-dominant norms, values, narratives, standards, and aesthetics. Um, there is a definition here um, of what we mean by non-dominant norms. Um, that's also included in the, uh, the, the materials on the website. So I would encourage you to take a good read through that definition. Um, and of course, if you have questions about what that means, reach out to us so that way we can help uh, before you go into the application. And the last uh, narrative question here is to please give one recent example of the organization's greatest successes and explain why it is considered successful. In your response, consider your indicators of success. And finally, that excellent to outstanding response is that the evaluation clearly articulates why a specific program or event was determined to be successful. So that's a lot of information to digest. Um, we definitely encourage you to go through the application several times, take a read through it, work with your board, your staff, um, your colleagues to really consider all of these, uh, these narratives. And I think that's the financial section. So I'm gonna hand it over to Emily to talk about financials. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, definitely uplifting, you know, starting early, looking at those resources and, and really clearly looking at those um, application uh, questions and, and rubric. Um, another piece of the application are the financials, which um, is a, an important piece here because it also connects with the funding formula, which I'll get into in a few slides here. But the first thing, um, to note is that you are required to uh, provide your most recently completed 
uh, financial statement. So if you operate on a fiscal year, we'll be looking for your um, FY24 statement of actuals. And then uh, if you're on a calendar year, we'll be looking for your calendar year 2023 financial statement. What's new this year is that there's a threshold of whether you are required to provide audited financial statements or an internal financial statement, such as a, a profit and loss statement. In the past, it's been $600,000 in allowable income. Um, we recently um, got approval from the council to increase that threshold to $750,000. Um, so if you're looking at your most recently completed uh, fiscal year financial statement, if you are above the $750,000 uh, threshold, we'll be looking for you to submit an independent external audit um, prepared by a, a CPA firm. Um, and that should be um, submitted at the time of the deadline. If you are under that amount, we need a signed financial internal financial statement or like a profit and loss statement. If you happen to be in the middle of an audit or you might not have that audit completed um, by November 15th, make sure you let Laura or myself know, whoever your program director is, um, so we can work with you to get that um, financial statement no later than March 1st, 2025. So there is a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, so just want to note, just be in touch if you have any concerns about what the type of financial statement that you should be submitting, or if there's any um, uh, delays um, in, your, in your audited financial statements. And again, Holland, um, you will be uh, submitting FY24. So if you closed on June 30th of 2024, we'll be looking for FY24 or calendar year 2023, depending on how your organization operates. And again, be in touch with me if you've got questions there too. Okay, and all of that work, the, the why we require the financial statements is that you are also required to complete a financial table. So this is used, this is built into the application and should talk to that financial statement. So this is um, the table, you're basically breaking down your income and expenses for your arts organization, or if you're an arts program, um, really um, looking at how you are dividing up your uh, allowable income and non-allowable income and allowable expenses and non-allowable expenses in more of a, a, temp, a table format. So Laura mentioned earlier that we do have a template that's an, an Excel spreadsheet that's on the on the website right now, or you can request it from either one of us. We can send it to you in an email too. But really um, recommend looking at that to kind of start your table in an Excel sheet, and then you can kind of populate the table. Um, a lot of times that works a little bit easier for folks that are working with um, maybe a fiscal officer or a treasurer or, or somebody um, external from applying for the grants. Um, We've also developed an instructional video to walk through the financial table of the application too. So we will make sure you all have that um, as well. It just gives some helpful hints. Um, uh, the template does as well. So uh, that is the other part of that particular piece. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, Laura and I are then the ones that are evaluating the financials as well. So we're really looking closely at that table and your financial statement to again, to make sure um, that they talk to each other and we've got a good understanding of, of the financials. And part of the scoring has, has three pieces here that um, are on the screen. So we're looking at the financial in, uh, information indicates strong commitments to multiple and diverse income streams. We're also looking for um, if there's any significant financial changes um, in your organization's financials. So anything that's um, and anything that would support kind of any programmatic changes that might happen, um, something that might have changed with your um, mission or vision. Um, and, and by financial change, that would be um, anything that would be looking at a financial surplus for the year or a deficit. So we're just kind of keeping an eye on that. Um, and then again, if your budget is um, over $750,000, that, that threshold piece for an audit, we're also looking at um, if your organization is operating with a cash reserve or cash on hand for at least one year of your organization. And these details are also listed in the resources that are provided on the, on the website too. 
Um, and then just a note around some of the attachments that we're expecting. So Laura mentioned already in question C1 about the, the graphic of your organization's staffing structure. So really showing how your board staff, artists, volunteers are working together and what that structure looks like in a visual way. Uh, you also will be required to submit um, your IRS letter of determination so that we know that you are indeed um, tax exempt. Uh, and then also a signed uh, form W-9. Um, so just make sure you've got a completed one, make sure it is signed and dated as well. And just a, a helpful hint here, um, and we mentioned this um, earlier too, but before submitting your application, we're both here and available to review portions of your application, provide feedback, set up any meetings with your staff if needed, um, just allow for um, some time. So uh, just to make sure that we can get to everybody and everyone's questions, uh, we're uh, asking for at least 15 days prior to the application deadline. So if you have any specific requests um, to look at, you know, perhaps a section or a question that you might be struggling with, um, just let us know by October 29th, if possible. And just reach out to us around our availability too. We can always discuss that one-on-one. -on -one. All right, and I'm gonna run into the, uh, into the funding formula here too. I know we're limited, we're getting close to time, so I'm going to go pretty quickly here. Um, but just want to uh, make sure that everybody is aware of how the funding formula works and the variables that are involved here. So there's three specific variables to get to the grant amount. Um, and this, uh, this funding formula is applied to, to every organization. So we're looking at the total allowable income number. And that, is, that shows up in your financial table. So that's why Laura and I look really closely at the financial statements and the table because we're looking for that total allowable income number to be really clear uh, so we can drop that into the funding formula. Then there's the panel score, which is determined through the on-year application. So you all are going through the on-year application. At the end of the review period, you will have a panel percentage score. Um, and then that percentage score will also carry through to the off-year applications. So you essentially have this, this percentage for three years. Um, the cap allocation percentage, um, this is the one that has a little bit uh, more detail to it here. Um, this is really determined by our state budget that we get and the GFO allocation that's determined by our, our council. Um, we don't get this until later in the year, usually closer to the spring, like April, May-ish. Um, so it's really the last thing that that we determine, but it's a percentage of our of our budget allocation that is spread across um, the the organizations as well. So you can see an example here. Say you have a, a five hundred thousand um, uh, dollar allowable income. Perhaps you get ninety percent uh, for your panel score, and say the cap allocation percentage uh, is seven percent. Uh, your grant would look something like thirty one thousand five hundred dollars. And then another layer to this, uh, the cap allocation percentage in particular, uh, is that we um, have been implementing uh, what we're calling an equitable funding formula that was determined um, a few years ago. So in FY24, uh, we started this process of a five-year rollout of, of this uh, formula. So um, part of this uh, revision was that was looking at the cap allocation percentage, which initially was the same percentage for every organization, no matter what size they were. So it, you know, if you're a $100,000 organization or a multi-million dollar organization, the cap allocation was the same. So what the equitable funding formula is doing is we're dividing all of our organizations into tiers. So there's five different tiers based on your budget size and five separate um, cap allocation percentages. So you'll see on the screen, these are these are just goals of what we're what we're working toward. They're not set in stone by any means. They are really just goals here that that we're working through um, based on all of the other variables that are are in play here. But you can see, tier one are our smaller organizations at the top. Uh, tier two is slightly larger. Tier three is our mid-sized organizations. Tier four are our larger organizations, and tier five are our very largest organizations here. Um, and you'll see the goals on the screen here is that we're really working towards getting our smaller organizations a larger percentage. So goal would be to ultimately get to 15%. Um, 
at a five-year transition point. And then our largest organizations working to a smaller percentage over five years. So moving into FY26, this upcoming cycle, this will be year three of a five-year transition. So we're slowly working our way towards these goals um, over five years. Additionally, um, part of the um, kind of uh, guardrails that we have in place from the editors that helped us through this process um, is that we also are setting cap amounts. So no one organization can get, um, moving into FY26, um, anything over a $1.2 million um, award. Uh, and then at five years, we will be capping folks at $1 million. So no one organization would get um, more than a million dollars in, in each year. Additionally, there's some other transition priorities. So our, our smaller organizations, tier one and two, are looking to increase their rate at a, a faster rate over five years. Tier three, our mid-sized organizations, were looking to remain stable during the transition. And then tier four and five, our largest organizations, um, we are looking to not decrease more than a rate of 1.5% um, from year to year. So I'm not going to go through this whole table just based on time here, but this gives you kind of an, an overview of what this is looking like in process. So you'll see the tiers on the left hand side, um, the number of organizations in FY24 and 25 listed in each tier, the cap allocation and what that transition is looking like from FY24, which was the first year, FY25, the current year, which is the second year, um, and kind of what the funding is looking like by tier and, and kind of in, in chunks, if you will. Okay, so I'm gonna allow you to look at that at your leisure. Um, there's more information. If you are confused by any of that, please be please reach out to us. We are happy to explain in more detail and how it might impact your specific organization too. And then I'm just gonna wrap here with the Smart Simple Grants platform. We've got just a couple minutes left here, but most of you should be familiar with the, the platform, um, which you can access on nearly every grant page of, of our website but it's also marylandarts.smartsimple.com. Um, so you must submit your application through this system, through your organization that should be already set up with a profile. Um, so uh, again, you, you'll have access to this um, once you log in. Um, and as Laura mentioned earlier, just make sure when you go to get your updated UEI information that it's, um, that it's added to your organizational profile. You won't be able to add it into the application itself. You'll wanna go to edit your, your profile. Um, also, just a reminder, there's been a lot of transition with staff. We know that and we're aware of that. So just make sure while you're going into the system um, for the application to check your contact information and just make sure you've got the best email address so folks that are receiving those notifications moving forward um, will get them. And this is a quick overview of what that would look like. You're going to log in to your account, um, which you should already have. And then uh, once you get to your dashboard, you'll have, um, you'll see a My Application screen. You wanna click on the Opportunities section and it will bring you to a listing of all the different grant opportunities that are available to our organizations at this time. It will look different than the list on the screen, but it looks something like this. Um, so you are going to look for the Grants for Organization and click the one that says Full Application next to it and click that Apply Now button. And that will essentially open up your application um, to get you to, to the pa page to start completing the sections that we went over today. One thing that we highly recommend is that you click the Save Draft button immediately. So that way it kind of activates all the pieces within the application. Um, and the system now auto saves. It hadn't done that in previous years. So that's um, something as you're adding information, the system will auto save, thank goodness now. So hopefully you won't lose any information. You can always come back to your drafts. You can start this and come back to it under the in progress section of your application. So you do not need to, once you get that draft started, you don't need to go back to the opportunity section. You'll find your drafts in in progress. And you'll want to complete all of those sections by November 15th at 1159. And I think that's just about everything. So um, again, Laura and I are here to help you through the process. Do not hesitate to reach out um, and we're happy to answer any questions. 
we just hit 11 o'clock. So I think we, we did it in exactly 60 minutes. All right, well, I'm sorry that we don't have time for uh, live questions and answers here. Um, but like Emily said, we are here to help with any questions. Feel free to reach out to us one on one. Uh, and we were more than happy to to work with you to help you through any of this. Um, again, November 15th, put it on your calendar and uh, and we'll look forward to seeing your applications. Great. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everybody, for being here. See you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.